This is the concluding lecture and event of Convocation 2014. Just to remind you all that Convocation 2015 is a week later. It's Columbus Day and Tuesday, Wednesday, and we will be with the Archbishop of Canterbury and the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. Uh, and the focus of Convocation 2015 will be the consecration of the new chapel. And we're very mindful of, of the obligation to mission and reaching out, and that's one of the delightful impacts of Convocation. You're very aware of the way in which so many alums obeyed that injunction that went over the window, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. And just to remind you, Dr. Jones has suggested that there be a table for those gathering at lunch who would like to talk further about the seminary and mission. So this is the second Zabriskie lecture. And as I listened to Chuck Matthews yesterday, I was minded, reminded of the occasion in 1982 when I went to see a new band that just sort of getting traction uh, in the UK. I was living at King's College London. I had a friend in the dorms who, for five quid, managed to get a ticket to see you too. So I hadn't heard of them, and I found myself at the Lyceum, which is just off the Strand, right at the front, with Bono just about there. And, uh, and I sat and watched Chuck as he presented the material, the combination of learning and wit and erudition and thoughtfulness and challenge and faithfulness to the tradition. And I thought to myself, yeah, this is the Lyceum all over again. You know, give him 20 years, he will be a podcast issued by Apple that every single person will have on their mobile devices. <laughs> because in the end, he is bringing uh, the Anglican social ethical tradition alive. Uh, he's reinvigorating the uh, important connections between the gospel and society. And we're very much looking forward to his second presentation this morning, and he's promised me he will stand motionless with his voice speaking clearly into the mic <laughs> throughout. Please give Chuck Matthews a very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When Ian said that um, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury and the presiding bishop were coming next year, and I would not have to follow them, but be followed by them. I thought he was my friend. <laughs> but then, when he, um, when he tried to compare me to Bono, uh, <laughs> I, I knew he was just setting me up for a fall. So <laughs> thank you very, very much. Yesterday, I argued that the growing inequality we face in this society is a very serious challenge in many ways not least to our com common commitment to the common good. This is both a direct challenge to the immediate sustainability and health of our overall social order, and also, speaking theologically, a challenge to any church, such as ours, which aims to cultivate in its members a broadly sacramental imagination about creation, out of which they will live. Churches should respond to this challenge, I argued, by shaping their own pedagogy of Christian discipleship to identify these challenges as spiritual challenges, not just social, but spiritual challenges, and work to resist them through articulating a rival and liturgically informed way of life that has some powerful antecedents in earlier formulations of the social gospel. Today, I want to shift from questions of the common good to simple justice, criminal justice in particular, but the possibility of justice more broadly. If the challenge of the common good that I was talking about yesterday was ultimately in some important ways a, a challenge to the metaphysics of we the people, right? the metaphysics of the possibility that there is a we that in some sense a political community can constitute itself around. Not as a substitute church, mind you. 
not as um, a, a compensational reality uh, because some of us don't go to church. That's not what I'm suggesting. But as a political entity itself, is there a way that a political entity can have some distant, analogous, shadowy foreshadowing of the possibility of real community, the community that we practice, we try to inhabit in the churches and anticipate in the kingdom of God? If yesterday's lecture was about that, the metaphysics of the possibility of a common good, today, in a way, the question before us is the meta-ethics of the possibility of justice in our society at all. I'll structure this lecture in many ways, much like yesterday's. I want to give you some data and some uh, facts just to get some stuff on the table. I want to offer a, a, an analysis of that data um, and then offer some suggestions for an ecclesial response, broadly speaking, uh, which in the Q&A you will all expose as woefully insufficient, just like you did yesterday, I hope. I want to end, though, by also offering some general thoughts about why the overall agenda that I've sketched in today's lecture and yesterday's must come from ecclesial institutions. It will get very little direct succor from the academy. The universities and colleges of this nation and other nations are very fine things, but the energies you will be able to rely on coming from them, as I suggested yesterday in the Q&A, um, you cannot count on us. This has to come from you. So let me start talking here about criminal justice. And consider, first of all, the astonishing explosion in the US prison population from the 1970s forward. And I, at the end of this lecture, I'll come back and say this uh, again. It is interesting and not entirely accidental, I think, that both of the patterns that I've been describing, this growing inequality, and the creation of what's called the punitive turn in American criminal justice both seem to emerge at the same time in the early 1970s. I'm not sure what this means yet fully, but it's a fascinating fact. The best statistics we have about punishment and incarceration in America go back to 1925. But there are other statistics going back to the 1880s at least, and they all seem to suggest the following. In this period, from 1925 or 1880 to around 1980, late 70s to 1980, the incarceration rate in the United States varied around 100 prisoners to 100,000 people, right? From about 85 at the lowest to about 120 at the highest, but mostly moving within that, that range there. After about 1977, and especially after about 1982, that rate began to rise. As of 2008, it broached over 500 prisoners per 100,000 people. And while it seems to have begun a modest decline in the past couple years, since 2011 perhaps, it remains at or above 500. That means that one out of every 200 people in the United States, fully half a percent of our nation, is in any given year incarcerated. I simply didn't have time this morning to Google the statistics for the People's Republic of China. But I think we win. This is another way, another kind of aspect in which America's on top. This system is hugely racially disproportionately delivered or distributed, as economists like to say. Michelle Alexander has argued in her book, The New Jim Crow, that there's a good case to be made that the main effect of the change in US criminal justice since the 1970s is to create and sustain a huge carceral underclass, an underclass of prisoners and ex-cons of overwhelmingly African-American men who are thereby marginalized from the social order and kept out of the nice parts of American public life. Right? By and large, many states actually forbid um, uh, felons from voting and forbid them for life from voting. African-American boys born today in the United States. Well, this statistic is from 2012, but I'm not sure that it's changed that much. Uh, African-American boys born in the near present um, in the United States um, have a one in three chance of going to prison at some point in their lives. More African-American men, this is a statistic that Alexander has made quite famous and I think interestingly, more African-American men were in prison in 2013 
than were enslaved in 1850. And this echoes massively across generations again, as children of criminals seem to go to prison seven times more frequently than children of non-criminals. Right? Furthermore, at the same time that this criminal distribution system has seemed to target certain racial segments of our population, we have also change the character of what goes on in prisons. Punishment today is radically punitive, not corrective. We incarcerate, but we don't correct. There has been a huge disinvestment since the 1980s inside correctional facilities, even as we have expanded the number of correctional facilities to the point where the wonderful statistic about since the 1980s, California has opened one new university and 18 new prisons, right? It's great, great little aside there. Even since um, this large-scale expansion of the prison system, just to accommodate the people who we want to um, house in it, we have, we have reduced the amount of services in prisons that would help people figure out how to make their lives better on the outside. And aid for prisoners, even after um, they are in prison, has gone almost entirely away. In fact, we have seen in the past 15 to 20 years a rise in a new industry, private for-profit prisons. This is a fascinating kind of way of monetizing our own vices. Right? It's an interesting thing. This is all really ironic because um, for a long time, the United States was considered around the world as one of the great innovators in prison development. In fact, those of you who have ever read Tocqueville's Democracy in America might know the way that Tocqueville got money from the French government. He got a grant from the French government. Even then, people were trying to figure out grants. The way he got a grant from the French government to go visit America was to do a study of Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, just outside Philadelphia. Um, so at one point, America was considered one of the great innovators um, in prison reform. But our system has become almost entirely uh, punitive, indeed counterintuitively and counterproductively so. Today, US prisons are factories of criminality the best predictor of whether a person will be arrested in the future or statistically commit a crime in the future is whether they have been in prison before, right? So we are effectively creating the situation that perpetuates itself in this curious way. Furthermore, on top of this, there has been, and this is a longer term pattern in American society, but it has uh, accelerated in the last four or five decades, there has been an interesting stigmatization of criminality itself. As we have become more and more um, uh, indifferent to and hostile to um, the criminals among us, the possibility that these criminals might be related to us, might actually be our neighbors, might actually be in our families, has become more and more impossible to conceive. And so criminality itself has become an enormously socially stigmatizing burden in a way that it wasn't always before. And all of this is happening to us in the midst of a massive decline in crime rates, the largest decline in crime rates this nation has ever seen. Since 1993, 1993 to 2012, but the statistics are better now, but this is the last I could get, since 1993, Violent crime in the United States has declined by 48%. The last time violent crime was at levels at it, that it is at today was 1963. I read uh, in one statistic this morning, you could get a gallon of gas for 23 cents. But nonetheless, poll after poll shows that the United States population believes rather vigorously that we face a huge wave of crime and that criminality is at levels never before seen in our nation. These statistics, by the way, have been reliably presented since the uh, late 70s. Right? Excuse me for a second. One consequence of the curiosities of our penal system is that criminal, larger criminal justice system, not just the judicial system, but the larger from the police all the way through the prisons and correctional agents, correctional officers. 
There is a large divide in who makes and enforces the law and who gets punished and policed under the law. At the same time that mandatory minimums and severe drug laws are coming into place in the United States, this is in the early 1980s, we are also seeing the large-scale deregulation of Wall Street. Certain, stigma, certain social actions are stigmatized and certain social actions are communicated as A-OK. -okay, right? And it's a fascinating fact that, in fact, um, there are ways in which the publication of certain, um, certain uh, sets of data or certain concerns about large-scale criminality are able to be mobilized in this time to delegitimate the further punishing of white-collar crime at the same time that you are, publishing, you are punishing um, violent crime in these ways, and drug crimes. And of course, the statistics on this are well known, but um, the requirements for possessing or for what is it, possessing a, a gram of crack cocaine were five times as severe as the uh, punishment for a gram of plain cocaine. Right? Um, so it's in some ways we're stigmatizing crack. Right? Why are we stigmatizing crack? Because crack is an African-American drug in social perception of it, right? It's not actually true, but that's never stopped us before. But more than that, more than the control of the laws and who gets to say what a law is, right, which has largely been a matter of anxious white suburbanites deciding how to police inner cities, which they mostly experience on TV, along with that, there is also the fact that policing structures in the United States have grown increasingly colonial. The police in many, uh, many cities are not at all um, representative of the people that they are policing. We saw this rather famously in Ferguson, Missouri this summer when you had a police force of, I believe it was 97, with three African Americans in a city of 60, of 60 percent, 60 to 70 percent African American. Um, also, juries are often um, selected disproportionately out of um, uh, races that are able to be uh, serving on juries not necessarily racially representative of the people who they are trying, nor are they connected in any relevant way to the neighborhoods or the communities in which the crimes occurred. Our blindness to the legal system is connected again to this blindness to criminality I pointed at before. We simply don't see any continuity between ourselves as good people trying to establish justice and the unruly masses who are elsewhere who we want to, in some sense, police. This is all a relatively long-term development, and this is not in any way a politically partisan fact. This is an interesting story about what happens when a vital conception of universal sin seems to disappear in society. The most interesting work on this has been done by a, a scholar named Karen Haltunen, who wrote a wonderful book called Murder Most Foul, the killer and the American Gothic imagination. Haltunen makes the argument in this book that effectively in American society, we have seen a rather remarkable rhetorical shift in the location of the criminal. Put it this way, in the 17th and 18th centuries, there was a genre of preaching that you probably didn't learn about in uh, preaching classes called the execution sermon. The night before an execution, a minister would mount the scaffold where a person would be hung the next day and preach a sermon to the prisoner, to the prisoner, and to a larger congregation. And the entire point, the generic point of this kind of sermon was there, but for the grace of God, go the rest of you. In other words, the point of the sermon was precisely to draw the, vic the, the, the victimizer back into the moral community, to identify their status as another person standing before God in judgment, under, under God's judgment. Today, no such genre, uh, rhetorical or otherwise, allows us to represent the connection between the murderer or the criminal um, and the rest of us. In fact, it has become increasingly hard for us to see them as anything other than monsters, something inhuman, 
or sick. Right? Either they are subhuman because they are in some sense uh, messed up and so not able to be fully human, or they are in some sense superhuman, right? like Darth Vader or Hannibal Lecter. But the possibility of a truly human person who does the sorts of things that we know we do actually has a harder and harder place to imagine in our society. And so this practice of stigmatizing criminals loops into this larger cultural change in our society in very interesting ways. All of this cultivates in us. Oh, no, sorry. Furthermore, and one last thing, this system is incredibly sticky, and it leads to an idolatry of punitivism. It is unlikely to change in the near term, just like inequality. Inequality is not something we can immediately and directly just stop and dime, right? Same thing with this criminal justice system. It is enormously complicated. It will take a long time to work itself out. This doesn't mean we shouldn't stop we shouldn't start working for it, but. but this system is unlikely to change in the near term, especially since the politics of crime are so pathological in the United States now. The moralism with which this topic in politics is commonly discussed cries out for engagement by the church. In no other context or sphere of American public life does a more immediately ethical language appear so apparently naturally than it does in speech about crime, and what we continue to call in our no longer truly excusable ignorance, the criminal justice system. What do I mean? I mean that if you hear any American politician talking about justice, it is almost inevitably about punishment. When was the last time you heard someone talking about justice, and then they said, and that's why we need to give more food to poor kids in schools, right? No, no, no. Justice is now entirely a, it's a code word for the lash. Right? Justice seems in these moments to be rather securely tethered to the severity of punishment proposed, as if the most savage Torquemada were in fact the wisest Solomon. All of this cultivates in us, as Christians and as ordinary moral folk, certain distortions. First of all, it allows us to, it encourages in us a moral callowness and cynicism that tries to avoid the facts of our reality. Insofar as we do know these facts, we protect ourselves from them by, confront, by, 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 avoiding, the, by avoiding allowing our knowledge to have any purchase on us by becoming cynical about it. We gain a corrosive skepticism about the possibility of a truly decent justice system or justice or the possibility of justice at all in this world. Just allow yourself to contemplate this thought. What would it mean for people in the United States to be proud of our nation's criminal justice system? To think of it as an example, a light to the nations. Furthermore, there is frustration, and not simply um, among racial minorities, about what we judge criminal and what not. Right? The entirety of the Occupy Wall Street controversy seems to have been about the question of whether or not there was, in fact, any justice done um, to what happened on Wall Street. Finally, this broadly undermines people's faith in the law as law, and also in the idea of justice itself. Once again, our socio-political system has implications for our broadest psychology and moral agency. One of my ex-colleagues at the University of Virginia, she's now at Yale, Veshla Weaver, has written about the civic and political implications of the carceral state. What she means is that there are now somewhere between 10 and 20 million people in the United States who have an experience, direct or otherwise, with the policing and law enforcement system, which has taught them how they ought to relate to political engagement in this country. 10 to 20 million people who might have been actual active citizens, but now understand that the only way they will ever encounter the government, the we, the people, that they are supposed to be a part of is by being caught by the police and being attacked by the criminal justice system again. Now, how should Christians exist in the midst of this context? What are the things that Christians ought to do? Well, on one hand, 
First and foremost, there's a practice, an obligation, a duty to render visible what is going on. What are we like as a nation? What are we like as individuals? These forces, although they are, of course, much more powerful than individuals, are effectively the consequence of decisions we have made. This is truly a nation of we the people, and we are ultimately responsible for it. For my undergraduates at, U at UVA, I often say, um, in the path, there are uh, right now no capital punishment uh, cases moving towards uh, denouement in Virginia. But in the path, I have said, um, when there's an execution, you understand that you're the ones doing this because you are the sovereign. There's no king. The president is your employee. right? So you're the ones killing people. And it's fine if you want to do it, but just be aware that you're doing it. right? We're the ones putting people in prisons like this, and we're the ones teaching them on the inside about what they need to know in order to succeed or not on the outside. We need to render visible to ourselves and to the rest of society what these prisons are like, what the criminal justice system is like from the inside. How many people have walked with a criminal justice defendant through a whole procedure? It is extraordinarily bewildering what actually happens. Oh, and one thing about that, I'm sorry, I did not actually say this, and I should actually say, say this quite explicitly. Um, another side of the criminal justice system, which is very interesting to work on and extremely troubling for those of us who might be more progressive, is that a lot of the problems seem to stem from the emergence of um, the Miranda Rights procedural justice era in the 1960s. What I mean by this is that from the 60s forward, almost all criminal cases slowly shifted away from being decided in courts to being decided by prosecutors and defense attorneys. In the 2000s, 2001 to 2010, the statistic was that 95% of all criminal cases never make it to court. Sometimes the defendants and the, and the victims don't even know that the prosecutor and the defense attorneys are working out a deal. Now, this is an interesting fact in itself, and it says a lot about bureaucratization and stuff like that, but William Stuntz, a law professor who, of blessed memory, he died in 2011, William Stuntz makes the point that effectively what it means is that we are foregoing 19 out of 20 opportunities to see some attempt at justice being done by us, right? Not by prosecutors and defense attorneys, but by the court system, which is supposed to be the structure that allows justice to be done in our society. Right? We have outsourced justice to a, to a bureaucratic and procedural rationality model. That's a huge mistake, it seems to me. Bill Stuntz, by the way, um, again, is a uh, very interesting and smart guy and um, uh, a, a pretty hardcore, small-R Republican of the sort we were talking about yesterday, people who are of a Republican persuasion, but not necessarily part of the larger question of how to deal with this racial stigmatization they've decided on. So there are, and I'll, I'll point this out later, there are ways in which left and right are actually working um, in common ways to reinforce, um, both to reinforce the system and to try to get beyond it. Okay, let me go on. In all this, we have to render visible what's going on. We have to recognize the criminality is human, not monstrous, right? We have to render visible what criminals are like. We have to recognize that those who commit crimes are often disquietingly continuous with ourselves, and that perhaps one of the more important parts of our reasonably daily prayer, lead us not into temptation, ought to be something we think about more seriously. The Christian churches in general have a big fight on their hands about whether or not the human is morally, by, by and large, properly put together with a few defective parts or a few defective examples who need to be penned up, or if there is something far more structurally and essentially wrong with us that needs redemption. That second story, that more pessimistic story, while it may seem like it's more of a downer, 
actually turns out, as I hope you might have heard in the past, to be rather liberatory for all of us. So render visible what crime happens to be, what prisons are like, what criminal justice is like in this situation, what criminals are like to us. And then third, we have to insist that justice be done, not procedural rationality. This is why that stunts piece is so important to me. We seem to be afraid of justice. We seem to be afraid of the possibility that courts could make mistakes or that courts might be sympathetic. Um, it seems to me that that's the essence of what our criminal justice system is supposed to be about. It's about common citizens deciding how best to reach out to their fellow citizens who have been wronged and who have wronged and trying to work with them to get some modicum of justice back in the system. We need to demand real trials and not plea bargains. And we need to resist the idea that bureaucratization and proceduralism are of themselves friends of justice or um, the vulnerable. They turn out not to be all the time. And in all of these things, Christians should understand that the example they want to give to themselves and to the world teach us a great deal about the relevance of a tradition of mercy in justice and about our society as a whole. Mercy, after all, is ontologically available for all of us though it may, not need, may, it may need to be articulated in multiple diverse registers. And this tells you that justice and politics are not all we are. So there's an evangelical message at the heart of this resistance to our current criminal justice system. The use of mercy is, on theological grounds, a sacramental reality. It speaks of, participates in, realities that have no native home in the worldview of sheer quid pro quo egalitarian justice. But it makes an appearance there in a way that simultaneously affirms the moral energies that make us seek such justice, but also graciously relativizes whatever justice we manage to achieve. This is especially important in the liberal social orders that we all, in different flavors, to different degrees, inhabit in our world today. We live in a broadly liberal political society. And I don't mean partisan liberal, right? I mean the political philosophy of liberalism. This kind of state, this political community, is all about de-theologizing, disenchanting the human sphere, or at least the explicitly political mechanisms within human society. Benjamin Franklin's famous line to the woman who asked him about um, why was there no presence of God in the Constitution? God is not mentioned in the US Constitution. Franklin rather puckishly replied, Oh, we, we forgot. <laughs> what they were trying to do, it seems to me, especially a thinker like Madison, was quite clearly create a space where theological concerns, which had, which had governed so much of politics in the past, um, and in, perhaps inevitably would, where those theological concerns and theological ambitions would be as minimized as possible, so that politics would be much more about mundane, management issues rather than issues of glory and conquest. This is a good thing. In many ways, we are fortunate to live in this kind of liberal state. But justice is one of the places where this kind of liberal state touches on issues of theological ultimacy. For justice is, I submit, inescapably, though not exclusively, about enchantment, about a metaphysical reality. This is in part why worries about the use of discretion by judges or others in the criminal justice system are often framed as worries about humans playing God. Questions about justice are, I think, inevitably, if often covertly, theological. In particular, the criminal justice system has an ineliminably ritualistic aspect as regards its visibly needing to mete out justice right, um, for crime through a broadly or ideally public judicial process. Bill Stuntz put it once, legal condemnation is a necessary but a terrible thing. The aroma of the apocalypse hangs about the judge as she or he goes about their daily work. Political and legal theorists sometimes try to capture this ritualistic dimension in a language of legitimacy. But this seems to me that this, in this aspect of human political reality, we feel the grip of ultimate matters. 
human politics, even in a liberal state, must of necessity court ultimacy. And even though in a liberal political era such as our own, the institutions often cannot be easily brought to acknowledge this fact, much less think through how that necessary courting ought to inform their own understanding of politics, it is an important fact that Christians ought to be aware of and they ought to communicate to the rest of society. Furthermore, this use of mercy teaches us about the limits of the polity and of politics as well. It reminds us that full and absolute justice is not a proper ambition of a liberal society, of any worldly order. And so living in these societies on their own terms is a fairly complicated and far from straightforward thing to do. One achievement of the liberal secular state is the prying apart over several centuries of the kind of theological um, horizon of our ultimacies from the more mundane political ones. And a second achievement, especially after Madison, is the recognition that politics needs to be continually reminded, um, especially its more enthusiastic and a devoted, um, vigorously devoted uh, partners, of this difference between ultimacy and what the political state is trying to do. We need to rain on the Rousseauian parade of the political uh, liberals in that way. Law's asymptotic ambition may be to achieve a one-to-one -one relation between civic justice and theological morality. And we've all heard arguments to this effect. And many times, we ourselves will participate in these arguments and endorse them. But speaking in politically realistic terms, we should not, we must not allow that longing free reign in mobilizing and guiding our legislative energies. Speaking institutionally and somewhat crudely, I mean that in liberal states, in liberal societies, lawyers and preachers play separate roles, and those roles should remain separate in some fundamental way. That's an important lesson that Christians can teach non-Christians, give witness to, um, and possibly also um, evangelize to them on this. Because it means that if they have theological ambitions that they are trying to find met in the sovereignty of the United States of America, they are inevitably falling into idolatry. Christians in this way ought to support a properly liberal state in the United States, partially because any other kind of formulation is going to be idolatrous. Third, the curious anxiety about the use of mercy, especially in justice, teaches us something important about the culture that we live in today, the larger and more an ironic crisis of authority in which we exist. The consumerization of justice, the managerialization of justice, the bureaucratization and proceduralization of justice. These are not simply bad tendencies in the criminal justice system. They're also all expressing a common fear, the fear of judging, the fear of imposing one's subjective reality on others or trusting others to do that, which is also the fear of authority and more precisely, of humans exercising authority over one another. This anxiety is expressive of an attempt to escape the human situation today, in which we have nothing more reliable than our own apprehension on which to base our necessary efforts at negotiating our world. I encounter this all the time with undergrads, right? Their, their view is that any kind of moral judgment of another person is, is, is improper. You can always get them back by saying, so your argument is that it's always wrong to make moral judgments about other people. Right? Um, but it's not just undergraduates, right? They're just the kind of canary in the coal mine for all of us. I would submit that if you actually had to sit on a jury, if you have sat on a jury, and I don't think pastors are typically picked for juries, <laughs> nor are professors of theological ethics, but if you have to sit on a journey, journey, uh, a jury, imagine what your situation is going to be like. You might feel compelled both, yes, I think this person is guilty, but oh my lord, what a momentous decision I am about to make. This is not about going to the Krispy Kreme for donuts or to Dunkin' Donuts. This is a momentous decision. The momentousness of those decisions, it seems to me, is something that weight of momentousness is something that we don't want to do away with. But very little in our culture lets us think that we might actually have the grounds to get it right. 
We should frankly recognize our desire to make justice impersonal and hence beyond critique, to make it ultimately unquestionably legitimate and hence non-political. Such a longing is an attempt, in Augustinian terms, to hasten the apocalypse. This need not be a surrender to relativism or an appeal to some sort of pragmatic communitarianism. Any sane form of theological or moral realism frankly recognizes that our judgments are our judgments and that we are responsible to them, for them and will one day be held responsible to them. All this is ironic, of course, because we live in a culture of expertise. Even as we've begun to doubt the possibility of our own authority, we live in a culture of expertise, the likes of which we've never seen before. The differentiation of roles and functions and jobs in contemporary society mean that we're required to trust others in various forms of authority, personal and apparently impersonal, more than ever in the past. So that just as our self-conscious acknowledgement that we need to respect others' authority has become harder for us to admit, the reality of those authorities in our lives is more vigorous than ever before. All sorts of dimensions of our lives have come under expert or pseudo-expert guidance in our society. Hardly any of us can even repair our own cars these days. Some of the more recent models actually, when you lift up the hood, the engine is entirely encased in another metal casing. So there's a hood beneath the hood. And you can't use a normal screwdriver to get it open. You have to actually go to the store, and they have special things to do it there. right? That's a kind of very mundane one. On a more material level, think about the idea that we have life coaches nowadays. What is a life coach? <laughs> this is part of the reason why, in our judicial situation, much of the matter that criminal justice system seeks to oversee never comes to a moment of explicit judgment. Because we all psychologically and culturally have an investment in avoiding as much as possible making decisions of ultimacy. So we'd rather hide it under the patina of bureaucratic legitimacy and delude ourselves that ultimate decisions are not being made. They are being made. They're just being made by algorithms and by lawyers in back rooms. Our explicit commitments to democratic egalitarianism, the legitimacy, legitimate privacy of individuals, vex any straightforward attempt to authorize sheer obedience to authority. But this just means that we live in ironic contradiction to the very conditions that make our lives possible. This is not an escapable condition, but it is good to be reminded of it. And every exercise of mercy subtly reminds us that we are the ones who must, in the end, judge in this dispensation. And that that role is inescapable for us. Its exercise in fear and trembling can, in fact, turn out to be a useful civic pedagogy as well as a personal theological training in humility and virtue. A last quick word here about the more fundamental sort of contributions that the churches can make in this question about civil uh, criminal justice. The law professors, criminologists, lawyers who work on these matters are in some important and necessary ways more immediate pragmatists. They're interested in working within the system, trying to figure out how to make it work better. There's no reason to think that people in churches should not endorse and affirm this kind of work. But the churches do not really work at such short ranges. We aim, or we should aim, to have an impact decades in the future. And in the United States context, we have failed over the past 40 years to grapple with several of the largest social changes in American society, including this one. In thinking about the system of punishment then, Christian churches, it seems to me, need to articulate, develop perhaps, and articulate a successful theological understanding of justice Will it involve hell? Will it involve a concept of the last judgment? What would the last judgment symbolize in such a thing? Some discussion of civic penal justice is needed in our own seminaries, divinity schools, departments of theology and religious studies. And it seems that such a discussion is only now starting. Let me step back from this immediate question and ask some more basic questions about this issue of a future social gospel. Imagine that you had a century starting in 1914 and ending in 2014. 
Imagine you split the century at the halfway mark, so that it ran from 1914 to 1964, and then 1964 to 2014. What do we see when we look at the century we've lived in this way? The period from 14 to 64 was probably the half century when the churches, and especially the ecumenical Protestant churches, had the most explicit influence on federal government policy and public discourse than they had had for a very long time. Explicit influence, right? Since 1964, it's been a quite mixed bag. There are definitely trends of progress in our society, some very good things, but there are also some disturbing social patterns as well. At the same time, the churches, and especially, again, um, the ecumenical Protestant churches, have seemed to lose something of the power of their voice, or at least the quality of clarity and sincerity that they had um, in, their, in their auditors, if not in their speakers. It's important to realize that right in 64-65, two important things happened in the United States. The Civil Rights Act was signed in 1964, and the Immigration and Nationality Act was signed in 1965. And those two facts about our society are momentous. They allowed for the much closer to real enfranchisement of large numbers of African Americans who had been disenfranchised. And they allowed for the enormous explosion of plurality in the United States um, that we've seen in the past 50 years. In fact, I saw a statistic last week that said that more Africans have immigrated to the United States um, in the last, since 2000 than had come over in the slave ships in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. It's an interesting fact. For the last 50 years, I would say, we have been engaged in a great, long, cold civil war in which various dimensions of the older system, forces that I will call white privilege, have fought tooth and nail to keep their status as long as possible. The patterns I've described in these two lectures seem to me two important facets of this struggle. There are surely others, but by and large, I think if we think about the long term, that's the context in which to actually think through where we are today as a society. I think actually racism still remains at the heart of a lot of our most fundamental social struggles. In this context, what sort of role can theological voices and religious voices, the voices of preachers, play? I think there are at least two roles. First, this voice can offer an indirect and long-term contribution through a, a practice of discipleship and evangelization, institutionally shaping those whose practices, habits, consciences, and worldviews are formed in substantial part by the ecclesial structures that these voices seek to inform. This is and must be the primary mode in which the Christian churches have influenced public debate, not by the immediate introduction or imposition of theological categories or frameworks on such debate, whether or not such categories or frameworks are welcome, but rather by the slow and steady drip of shaping minds in the churches and schools and the other forums where the theological voice has its primary, not its native nor its exclusive, just its primary home. This is the way that Christianity has in the past influenced the social imagination. Transatlantic, the abolition of transatlantic chattel slavery, the rise of the anti-abortion movement in the United States, the temperance movement, the transformation of Roman patriarchy in the fourth and through, fifth, through sixth centuries, and other things like that. If we think of the state of play in a culture at some moment as akin to the weather at a certain moment outside, we should also think about climate change as crucial too. And the churches should be playing the role of cultural climate change agents, as they have so often in the past. Furthermore, theology can also contribute directly to public discourse for those who have ears to hear. It can bring into salient view new and hitherto obscure aspects of an issue. Perhaps theology can identify certain perplexities or conundrums that humans in a certain setting or context confront, and it can do so because its own special idiom gives it, gives it conceptual capacities or psychological insights that other approaches may lack. We will need to do both of these things in coming years and decades and in the century to come. 
to respond to a condition that is unlikely to improve in the short term in any measurable way and in the long term in any permanent way. We still remain east of Eden and sin still crouches at our door and its desire remains to rule over us. And so it will stay until the end of time. Reinhold Niebuhr's line that the perplexities and contradictions of history will mount, not be relieved as history reaches its end, remains with me as a theological truism. But that doesn't mean that the work of the Christian community in witnessing to another way is not always, un, always to be begun. But this work will need to be done in seminaries and by preachers. It cannot be led by academics in universities like myself. The academy has its own incentive structures. And people who work in theology departments, or religious studies departments, or philosophy or politics departments, have increasingly become captive to the bureaucratic protocols of excellence and rigor, not to be confused with rigor mortis. <laughs> there is an enormous, enormous oil field of intellectual talent in the universities, which is almost entirely untappable by, by churches, precisely because the idioms in which they discuss things are entirely inward looking and Mandarin. It will need to be seminaries, divinity schools, and the churches themselves that find a way to recalibrate and understand how to live in this new world in a theologically intelligent manner. I want this to be very clear, so let me put it this way. For the last couple centuries, churches have, by and large, outsourced their brains to academics. That is a big mistake. We have decided to amuse ourselves in our own special ways, and you guys ought to get started on thinking for yourselves again. <laughs> in this, we can take inspiration from our forebearers, the great cloud of witnesses who have gone before us, preached and taught and prayed and failed by the standards of the world time and time again in the service of displaying, not only with our lips, but in our lives, a better way, a new way, not a way of living death, but of life, of being called to life. This way must be the way of the people who are hearing my voice. You cannot expect that the rest of the church will follow if you do not lead. In all this, you can find shape and strength and guidance and so it is with the saints and their example, so called to mind, that I end my two talks and say to you, go now and do likewise. Thank you. We've got a few minutes for questions. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, so we have, uh, let me think, we have 15 minutes or so for questions. Um, so thank you, Chuck, as you gather from the response, a lot of positive feeling. And I was going to provide a summary of what you had to say, but I think I won't bother because there's so many hands going up. So let's catch those hands. Yes, please. Um, Sarah Mitzelkowski, class of 2004. Um, I, I, work, I live and work in East Lansing, Michigan, and we had an incident over the summer where a um, Saudi Arabian woman was walking into a mall, and a group of young guys uh, was horsing around, and one young man decided to show off and ran up to her and went uh, to grab and disrobe her from her veil. And... Um, she reported this, and she was with her small children. Um, she reported this to her husband, who then called the police, and the police then found out who this young man was, 
and immediately brought him up on charges of harassment around, there's, we have the Michigan, oh, some sort of cultural, ethnic harassment. I'm sorry, I don't know the name of the law. So he was being brought up on those charges. He pleaded his innocence that he had just tripped or something like that. Um, this couple belonged to the Islamic Center that abuts the property of the church that I work in. Their president, who's a friend of mine, called me up out of the blue and said, this couple would like to offer this young man the opportunity to apologize, to admit what he did wrong, to apologize so that he may not be prosecuted because it carried two years sentence and all this stuff, and he has a young child, and they don't want, they want to give him, the focus was the opportunity to restore the honor that he had tossed away right. to himself, his family, his kin. And so I, we approached together the um, county prosecutor who was not at all interested, um, and after much cajoling, finally did begrudgingly say, well, I guess I can talk to the defense attorney. Now, that was enough of a miracle, frankly, for me. But in the end, and unfortunately, the young man had enough chutzpah, hubris, you know, every, you know, ego to still rebuff any attempt. So what I'm, what I'm, my question is in all of this is when did we give up and where did we give up the ability to have matters of this nature settled between the wronged party and the wronger and not ha lose the ability and have it flung into the hands of prosecutors who really don't care, it seemingly much, about the wronged. Yeah, so St Stunts' book tells a good story about this um, that you, uh, you see with the increasing attention to procedural justice in the 60s after the Miranda case and following cases. Um, uh, police uh, departments and uh, prosecutors, and then eventually defense attorneys, all become disciplined in a new way to focus entirely on a proper set of procedures and, and basically flowcharts. And that leaves out the possibility of a lot of subjective intervention. Now, the good part of this is, right, that you don't have cops making these decisions on their own, and some of them are bad cops, some of them are good cops, right? We've seen all these movies. Um, and so the idea was, if we make it procedural, we will be protecting vulnerable people. That might be true. The danger, though, as Stunts points out, is that we've lost the ability to actually have a system of genuine justice. We have this kind of flowchart system. And so. Jennifer McKenzie, also class of 2004. Um, I was struck listening to your presentation, which I appreciate greatly, that um, I wonder that if in your studies, if you substituted those with brain illnesses, also known as the mentally ill, for the word criminals, I suspect that little of your presentation would have had to change. And um, as that thought crossed my mind, I'm connecting this back to comments that you made yesterday about narcissism um, and this idea that these other people are not the same as me. So I'm wondering how much of this problem of prisons becoming the new mental hospitals, of our acknowledgement or fail to acknowledge um, those who commit criminal activity as human, how much of this is related to our aversion to talking and thinking and preaching about sin? And I'm also wondering what this, you know, is that our de-theologizing? And I'm also wondering um, what this says about our ecclesiastical court system. Well, I, I, won't, I, won't, speak to, I won't speak to ecclesial court system at all. You want to get the other question and I can say both? Or you want to say something? No, 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 sin is, I, I, it seems to me sin is um, uh, very, very important here. Um, it would be useful, not just sin, but... Um, uh, maybe a language of vulnerability before sin uh, would be very useful for us. Not to encourage us to think of ourselves as victims of sin, but rather to recognize that even the most high accomplished of us or whatever is deeply broken in some profound ways, 
um, that would at least render us maybe more susceptible of seeing people who have made some very bad life decisions that sometimes cause the deaths of other people as more continuous with us than, than otherwise we would imagine them being. Um, we live in a world of high achievement. We live in a culture that glories in um, accomplishment. Um, all of us have uh, forms of injury, uh, insecurity, anxiety that we don't we don't have a, a vehicle, a language to talk about. Um, and you know, a, a richer theology of sin might be, I would like to think, one way of talking about some of that, rendering us more realistic about who we are. And that might, might, might render us more able to talk to other people as fellow victims, fellow sufferers in our common condition. Right? Yeah, just, just on that, yeah. and then we'll come to the gentleman at the back, but yeah. just on that, that's a, a nice a liberal twist on sin, because traditionally, of course, the right to use the language of sin to justify deterrence and punishment, and the left has played down sin and stressed circumstance and environment, and you just got to get that right, and then there'll be less. You're actually saying sin will lead to empathy, which therefore ought to lead to mercy. Now, that's an interesting twist on the yeah. normal way the debate. Okay. Yeah, it's... I don't want to take credit for it. I mean, in some ways, I feel like that's part of what both of the Niebuhr brothers were arguing. Um, and I think it's, it's very much visible in Augustine's writing on sin, too, right? Which is why Pelagius was so upset at Augustine. Right? Pelagius started that fight, by the way. It wasn't Augustine's fight. It was Pelagius who started it. And Pelagius was upset because Augustine seemed to be suggesting that people who are screw-ups might actually be legitimate Christians. It's a wonderful essay by a late antique scholar named Robert Marcus called Augustine's Defense of Christian Mediocrity. <laughs> and I myself am a big believer in the cultivation of mediocre Christians. If your congregants end up at the end of their lives being able to imagine that they will go before God and say, um, please have mercy on me, a sinner, that's an accomplishment. You, know, you have gratitude, you have joy, you have all these things, but... Um, being able to recognize this, I, I very much am alert to the ways in which a language of um, this sort can be used very abusively. I don't want that, but to, to keep that vigorous is very important. Okay, at the back, me. Um, Julius Jackson, uh, class of 1988. I really thank you um, for what you just said today because um, the prison system is dear to my heart. I've been doing this work for over 30 years. And I also had a prison congregation at Griddleford Prison. But my question is, you mentioned the word justice. Like late Richard Pryor said, you go into the system to look for justice. All you find is just us. Mm -hmm. So how is it that the church, you know, you said seminaries should do a lot of this work. I believe a lot of this work should start within the diocese, then brought to the seminaries, because these people see us every day. And I think it's so sad because the people within the pews who pay the bill don't have the foggiest idea how to deal with the system. When you see a gentleman who's been incarcerated for 40 years, Never seen people because he was way up there. And my question to you, what is it that we as a church, as we talk about social justice, be doing with this long-term incarceration? When you know somebody just steals, um, I had a guy in my congregation for petty criminal. He was given two 40-year sentences. He didn't kill anyone. But just a petty criminal. And this goes on every day. What is it that the church could do about that? I think the first thing the church could I think the first thing the church could do is tell these stories and tell them with the backup of these statistics I'm giving you. Um, my, 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 what I, what I, what, the first thing I said is just make make this visible to us. We have by and large outsourced um, the execution of criminal justice, both to this procedural system and also to places far away from where most of us occupy things. Um, a thing I tell my undergrads about capital punishment is, you know, we spend a lot of money in the American entertainment industry creating the more, more and more realistic representations of death, 
right? You can see really good murders or battle scenes or whatever, and they're very, very realistic, and people praise them for this all the time. But at the same time, um, I have proposed that we maybe just have a TV channel where we actually show actual executions of people. This would be much cheaper, by the way, and, and this would not just be fake. These would be real executions, so why don't we do that? Right? I mean, this is a little bit of a modest proposal, so I admit. <laughs> but I mean, it's an interesting fact, right, that we spend all this intellectual and financial capacity creating fake things that we actually do, but we don't allow ourselves to see. And we're the ones doing them. Okay, okay what I'm going to do, we run out of time. Yeah, sorry. So what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, the three hands or so, the center here, that lady there, uh, uh, you just front, and then so. <laughs> and the five quick comments, and then you get the last word. I'll say it already. Hi, uh, John Musser, uh, Diocese of Arkansas, class of 2017. Um, one of the things that I've taken away from your talk, and pretty much everything you've said has resonated with me, but it seems like all of this is founded upon the notion that if we form, if we educate our congregations, those statistics, that information is going to galvanize them towards um, developing a greater sense of mercy, towards uh, uh, changing the way in which we act and behave in the world. Um, and recently in Arkansas, just last month, we had a Senate candidate who got caught red-handed in a very, very clear lie uh, and um, basically didn't apologize for it and stood by the, uh, the statement he made. And NPR, I believe, used the term post-truth uh, and a post-truth society uh, that we have moved into. And uh, I'm wondering how this apathy towards the real nature of the situation, even when we're confronted with those facts, even when we're confronted with that data, what do we do about this apathy towards that information? Richard Tolliver, class of 2003. In terms of the churches being advocates for social justice, like you said, we can't rely on the universities. Seems to me a model of that is the civil rights movement that many historians have said basically came out of churches. And they were the ones that mobilized their congregations often in terrible circumstances well, if you stood up, you might lose your job or worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Grace Cangelosi, class of 1989. Um, there may not be time for your response, but um, related to what the young lady from uh, East Lansing mentioned, I was wondering if you see any hope at all in the restorative justice movement that Howard Zare and some of the others are really working hard on. Do you, do you see that as a hopeful antidote to some of these things? Thank you. Uh, just to thank uh, Virginia Seminary for bringing this discourse to, uh, before us and to talk a little bit about, um, you, you said uh, we avoid making decisions and to say that avoiding uh, making decisions has gone down to the um, elementary and high schools where principals and teachers have given up their authority to resource officers that are actually police officers in the classroom. And I wanted to say that because the people in this room uh, know of others if they are not deputies to general convention next year and can bring resolutions to general convention with regard to restorative justice, with regard to training for police officers, uh, cultural competence, and, 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 and the like. So I just wanted to share that to know that those avenues are open. We'd love to come in, but we've run out of time, sir. I'm very now going to answer very elegantly and very briefly. Yes. All those yes. 
I think restorative justice is a very important thing. It's part of another, a, a range of other things, including neighborhood policing, which seems to have been doing a fair bit of good. Um, they're very small right now. I'd like to see them more broadly expanded. But also, I would like to see them held up as examples of the kind of thing just for people to learn from and be inspired by. So I think, again, they're in this broad sense of evangelical, their evangelical power is almost more effective to me than their immediate social material power. Um, the civil rights movement was indeed a tremendous movement of, uh, of the sort that I'm suggesting. And in the story that David Hollinger tells about the travails of ecumenical Protestantism, it was precisely um, the civil rights movement that is the consummation and the annihilation of um, the ecumenical Protestants' power in society because they had gotten so far out ahead of their congregations that they were able to accomplish a great deal, but they actually harmed themselves, especially vis-a-vis -vis the more conservative um, evangelical churches, um, almost all of whom were happy to play the race card at this point and did rather vigorously play the race card um, at, this, at this point. Um, if we inform them Will they change because we live in a post-truth society? I totally get this worry. And um, I do think it's dangerous. I, 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 I'm of really two minds on this. On one hand, it's astonishing the kinds of um, inanities you can find. Um, and on the other hand, it feels like to me there, is enormous, um, there are enormous resources out there to do good with. Uh, more, than, more than I've seen in the past. And so I, I feel like at least give people the opportunity to be, um, uh, to be caught out in their lives. Um, and let's see what happens from there. Okay. Let me just yes. make my concluding comment. It is indeed a great privilege to listen to a scholar uh, who's deeply committed to the church and has offered such a refreshing survey of such key and important social issues of our time. And it's been a privilege to have you with us, and we've enjoyed your presentations. I'm pleased to announce that they're available or will be available on our website so you can view the stream and revisit the arguments that you've just heard. I want to thank those who've been enjoying the stream. We've had hundreds who've clicked and been with us in this room, and we're delighted you have made that journey and spent time with us uh, today. Please stand for the conclusion of convocation. Uh, I'm going to use the dismissal of Charlie Price, which, of course, uh, you heard when you were a graduating senior at the conclusion of the service for the mission of the church. And when I get to Alleluia, 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 I invite you to say, thanks be to God, Alleluia, Alleluia. You may, Lauren. Yes, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed in what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. I feel I ought to do an absolution, so I will. Because we're reminded afresh that uh, by God's grace, our frailty and brokenness is indeed through the power of what God in Christ has done, forgiven, not by what we've done, but by what God in Christ has done. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Go forth now in the name of Christ. Go to the city and the country. Go to the distant lands and nearby places. Go where his name is well known 
and where it's never been heard. Go to the strong and the weak. Remember the weak. Go to the rich and the poor. Remember the poor. Go to those who welcome you and those who reject you. Pray for your enemies. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. Thank you, everybody.